That's uh, God's Pocket, which is in cinemas uh, on from Friday. Please welcome the director, writer, and producer John Slattery. Thank you. So, John, um, this is based on a book by Pete Dexter, which was published, I think, more than 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, when like did 30. you read it, and what was it about it that sort of you wanted to tell this story on film? Uh, I read it probably somewhere between 10 and 15 years ago. Uh, I, you know, I finished the book, and I thought, it, this is a film. I mean, the way it's bookended by the narration that Richard Jenkins does as the, as the reporter... Uh, a finite period of time, a, a, a condensed sort of fishbowl of a neighborhood. Um, but really the specific, the specific uh, tone of voice, the sense of humor appealed to me. It seemed like the people I grew up with. And it wasn't the same atmosphere. It wasn't the same physical atmosphere either, but it, but it was the same sense of humor. And I, the attention to detail, the way it went from violent to funny to almost slapstick um i thought if you could create that world physically if you could if you could convincingly render a world where that violence happens casually and no one and it's just something that happens off to the side eddie marzin gets punched in the face and then the next scene you see him he has a toilet paper stuffed in his nose and he just carries on and i i thought then it could sort of rise to the level of of absurd humor but was writing and directing something that was already in your mind then? Because, um, I mean, I, I believe you started directing with Mad Men uh, in yeah. about, uh, the, th the first episode aired around about 2010, but presumably this was before that point. Well, I wrote, I, as I said, I read the book, I tried to get the rights to the story and I couldn't, um, so I forgot about it. And then I was reminded of it. And someone said, you know, what hap whatever happened to that book you liked so much, I tried to get the rights again and was told the same people still owned it. So I thought, well, if they've had it this long, maybe they won't make it. Maybe they'll never make it. So I just thought, I'd, I'm going to start writing this and I'll figure it out. So I just was making a film, sitting in a trailer, doing nothing. And I thought, well, I can watch television or I can do that. I had been working on a film with... with um, um, I forget who it was, a playwright, and, and I, he was writing a play, and I thought, I'm doing the crossword puzzle, and he's writing the next great American play. Why don't I, why don't I stop doing, why don't I do something better than this? So I, when I was faced with that same choice of watching television or doing it, I thought, well, I, I, might, I might as well take a crack at this. And it took me years to do it, but then we worked out the rights, and, you know, and Phil Hoff, I gave it to Philip Seymour Hoffman, and, who I'd known for a while, and, and that made the situation a lot it really kind of paved the way for it to be made. Right. But I had directed in between. I didn't really have a very clear Im impression of what, of what I wanted, whether I, I mean, I guess I wanted to direct it when I looked after the rights, but I, but I'd never done anything like that. I just thought, well, this is a story I think I could tell. And then by the time it was finished, I had directed several episodes of Mad Men, so it seemed like the next logical thing to do. I understand. When, um actors sort of become producers or become writers or directors is often because they're looking um, for great roles that they'd love to play themselves. Yeah. Um, but you're not in the film. W did you no. flirt with um, appearing in it at any point? Um, no, the, the, the part of Shelburne was the part that I offered Phil Hoffman. And he said, I, I like this, I would rather play Mickey. And then it took me a minute to realize what a good idea that was. I, because I had known Phil so for you, a long time. So you were thinking maybe playing Mickey then? No I, I, no, I was thinking that I, I don't know who, I didn't really have a specific, all I had was Phil Hoffman. I had Eddie Marzan in my head for that part of yeah. Jack Moran. That was actually the first person I thought of as an actor. I mean, I, I had, you know, physical images and things. But so when Phil said he wanted to play Mickey, I had to kind of rejigger the whole thing in my head. Um, and I, and I I realized what a you know powerful physical you know person he was, both vocally and I mean I knew emotionally that he was and he had all you know, I'd seen him do everything, on stage and in film and as as many of us have and, but I'd forgotten he wasn't a small person and he was and he was intimidating, and and so once I sort of it took me a minute to get my brain around that idea and then, 
and then I thought, well, and then, then somebody asked me, well, are you going to play Shelburne? And I, but I, I didn't want to do that to myself. It was too much to bite off. I, 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 directing it seemed um, enough. How do you find directing yourself in, in Mad Men? Is that, do, do you tend to opt for episodes where you have less screen time, or do you, have you tended to gravitate towards episodes where you're very, very present? And, you and don't really have the choice. Well <laughs> you get the one you get, and it's usually scheduling, and, and because I'm there anyway as an actor, they usually ask me, is it okay if we push you back a month because so-and-so has a different, you know, something come up and I'm there anyway so it usually I just end up getting the one I get in the beginning they would write they would take the time to write the character down the, 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 in the one that you're in but you still have to prep the one so you're, you're acting in the one prior while prepping the one you're about to shoot so it's it became and then once I did it and they realized I could do it then they just said well you'll just have to deal with whatever comes <laughs> right uh, so the but the directing of myself is is it's fine it's just you have to take that much more time to do it you ha- you you have to you have to get a a monitor because on you know as, I don't know if you know but on small films and television there is no video playback at least in the states there it it takes too much time to go out and watch it and have everybody gather around and talk about it there's no time for that you shoot and then you you know you make sure you get it on film and then you know you do enough takes to give yourself options and you move on so it takes going out of the room watching the take considering it going back in doing another one it takes almost twice as much time so uh, which I don't mind but you have to build that time into the schedule and I didn't have that time on the film and I on the television show they would make that time right okay well I think it'd be great to show our first clip from God's Pocket Um, I won't set it up we'll just show it and we can talk about it So that was obviously Philip and John Turturro and Christina Hendricks in that scene. She seems to be less than impressed um, with him. She's generally less than impressed with him, with Mickey. I think that's, you know, Phil, Phil Hoffman would ask, up, up until I think the last day, why would he stay in this situation? Why would he? I was amazed for a guy who was so advanced in his craft and in his position in the business and in the world how elemental and basic his process is why he never stopped asking why but why the, why would why wouldn't he just get up and leave in a community where he's constantly reminded that he isn't from this place um and he's fighting so hard to get in and it becomes clearer and clearer that she doesn't want him and they don't want him and and uh, but yes, it starts out. She's very she's disappointed and disillusioned with with the situation with him as a husband, and um, and it's you can see it's fed to her sisters, and um, but but Bird, who who's Arthur Capizio, who plays John Turturro plays, is is kind of remains steadfast. He and his and his aunt, who in the trailer, the it, John Turturro's aunt Sophie is that's my mother-in-law. <laughs> By the way, that's my wife's mother, Joyce Van Patten, who's been acting for a long time. And um, they end up being, you know, it's kind of his family. Did you have a question? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I wanted to talk to you about, wh- I mean, al- although you obviously you don't act in this film, you had an uh, incredibly memorable scene in Charlie Wilson's War with Philip Seymour Hoffman, which is the best, uh, we don't like to make hierarchies in movies, but it is the best scene in the film. Um, how, how, how was that? And, um, and then how was directing Philip after that experience? That scene, that, that movie was directed by Mike Nichols. Um, and he, um, he they, I remember I showed up to Paramount and they had the whole soundstage um, furnished with each set. I mean, this huge garage, twice the size of this place, with the living room. There was a car, a limousine, on the on the floor, and where the, the I guess the scene took place in the limousine. There was a, an office with window. I mean, it was unbelievable. And I thought, oh look, that that looks like the office that that's my. And they and you'd you'd sit at the table and talk for a minute, and then you'd walk over 
and and there's the office and you would rehearse in the office it was i mean only mike nichols could do that but so we rehearsed it and um and we did it sort of by the numbers and um and then all of a sudden we started yelling and screaming at each other and i mean it was so, it became it was so clear that that was where it where and he goes i think that's where it lives and so when we got in wherever we went we shot it in some office park that's supposed to be the cia the following day that's kind of where we started and i think my voice started to go <laughs> And and they kept replacing the glass. He breaks the Phil Phil's character. We yell and scream at each other, and then he goes out in the middle of the scene. A guy comes in to replace my name on the window because Phil has broken it the day before. And then he says he grabs the wrench off the guy's wagon and says, "Can I borrow this for a second? And then smashes the window again. And we kept having to replace the the, the pane of glass. And and the one that they kept, the take they kept, he couldn't get the thing to break. He kept hitting it with his wrench, and it wouldn't break, and it was just hilarious. He kept, he could, he couldn't stop swearing. He couldn't stop saying, "And I fucking, and the fuck, why?" And he kept, and right in the middle of the take, he go, "Why the fuck do I keep swearing?" And and I, and I kept. He was slightly sp- departing from the printed uh, screenplay. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't, and, and no one said told him not to. And then. And we kept overlapping each other, and I would jump in, and he'd say, "I have another fucking line." It's like, sorry, you know, and, and it never. We would say, "I," you know, apologizing, you know. So he was staying in character. Instructions, just screaming at each other. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Was that his method? And when you, when you directed him, was he? Did, did he kind of become? Um, so he's peaked the character. Well, well, I mean, kind of. Not 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 so you couldn't communicate with him, but. I asked him that about Capote. I asked him, did, did you stay in character? And he said, well, yeah, so, so, sort of. I mean, I did, but mostly because if I stopped talking that way, I just wanted to go home. You know, and it was like it took such a, an effort for him to get to that point that, and he told me, and you know, this is indi- indicative of his work ethic is that when he started reading Capote and he started talking in that voice and and he said it was terrible. He said for so long it was so bad. And he just kept going, kept working on it. And in this, you know, he sort of had a piece of this and a piece of that. And we'd talk at two in the morning and, he, and he'd be, well, well, what? okay, what about that? So how do you, and we, we'd go to the hair salon and we'd try and figure out what, because he plays an Italian guy, whether he d- would color his hair or not. I mean, it just sort of put it together piece by piece. And then, and then some kind of, um, I don't know. I mean, I suppose with that's what art is, you know, that sort of alchemy takes over and, and then you just stand back and let him do what he's doing. Let's uh, play the next clip. Uh, we'll get to see um, Richard Jenkins's character in this clip uh, alongside um, Philip. That's a, an, another example of the wonderful relationship between um, Philip Seymour Hoffman's character and his wife, who, and uh, we should explain Richard Jenkins is playing a this sort of celebrity local journalist. Right. More of sort of a, a, a citywide celebrity journalist. This is a small neighborhood, but he writes for the city, one of the city papers, has for years, is a, is a celebrity. Um, in a day when journalists weren't everywhere, there wasn't as much media certainly as there is now you would read the paper every day and 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 this guy was a man of the people you know he had his column his picture in the paper and he would read about it tell you you know and comment about life in the city day to day stories of you know you know human interest stories of people in the neighborhood and they revered this guy and of course he held them all in great disdain and as a falling down drunk it, it definitely feels um, kind of of its time, which uh, you, yeah. the film is set in 1978, roughly. 78. Yeah. Because nowadays, you know, a, 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 co- a columnist working for a local city paper wouldn't be able to just write. I think he basically did one column a week, uh, right. pretty much. Uh, yeah. That's when he's sober enough to actually deliver it. Right. 
Um, I wanted to talk to you about your director of photography, Lance Accord, who's also one of the producers of the film. That's right. But I don't know um, if people know Lance as well, but he's incredibly selective about what he does. The last dozen years, he's more or less done two films with Spike Jones, two films with Sofia Coppola, um, and John's film, and, and a documentary. But right. he's incredibly selective. So how did that relationship come about? Uh, Lance is a director of commercials as well um, and has a company called Park Pictures who produced the film. A friend of mine produces there with him. I gave them the script and they agreed to produce the movie. And then at some point, uh, Lance and I were having lunch. We've been friends for a while. Um, he did uh, Being John Malkovich and uh, Adaptation, uh, Lost in Translation, Where the Wild Things Are, Marie Antoinette. I mean, he's just a, he's a brilliant uh cinematographer as well as a director in his own right um, and he claims that we had a drunken bet that, that if I could get Phil Hoffman to star in the movie that he would shoot it <laughs> I don't remember that bet but um, he did eventually say that he would shoot it um, or that he wanted to shoot it I think it was probably because he has children of um, we have kids the same age and he didn't want to leave home for a year and this was going to he didn't only have to leave home for you know a month six weeks I mean, you know, I know he liked the film, but that's probably the reason he did it. Did you shoot... I, I guess I should know this, but did you shoot it in, in God's Pocket? In we did not shoot it in Philadelphia, right. which is where it takes place. We couldn't afford to do that. Um, we couldn't afford to bring everyone to Philadelphia and put them in a hotel. So we shot it in, in Yonkers, New York, which is about a half an hour north of New York City and still looks like that. Um, wires hanging everywhere, and it's on the north of the Bronx. North sort of, of the Bronx. That's just up, where it is. Upstate, but not too far. Upstate. Yeah, not too far. Yeah, like twenty minutes, half an hour. It's it's a kind of a remarkable place visually, because um, we were once we couldn't do Philadelphia, we knew we had to put it in New York City. The daunting realization that we'd have to go from the Bronx to I don't know if you know New York City, but it's it's not as spread out as London, but it's congested, and it's I guess with all the boroughs, it all it's it's not quite as big still, but going from, be like going from, you know, I don't know, it goes from the Bronx to Queens to, to it's just too far to travel in the middle of the day with a congestion like this, you'd spend the whole day in the car. When we got to Yonkers, New York, we realized that it looked right period-wise and everything was there. The outside, the way he runs down the street, oh, you haven't seen that. He, he, there's a sequence where, there's a lot of outside sequences where he runs down the street, so you see a lot of territory. The thing that was great about Yonkers was you could shoot from here to the other wall and, and it would look period. Most period locations in New York, there's a McDonald's in the middle of it or there's something modern, there's something that would, would make, would force you to digitally remove it, which costs money. So this, you could see some distance. You could see some size, which gives the movie a sense of place and, it, it, and not of claustrophobia, I mean, entirely. Um, so that was good. And, and the, the meat processing plant, the funeral home, the auto body shop, the, the bar. I needed to find a place where there was a bar and a house across the street from each other that when you went in the bar, you could see the house, and when you went in the house, you could see the bar. I needed it. And, and they all thought I was crazy. I said, you need to see those two things in the same shot to prove how, what it would like to be living in this place. I mean, if you were just getting out of the shower, the people in the bar could be, you know, and that's what I, I that intimacy, that claustrophobic sense of place is what I needed. Great. Um, we're we're going to play the next clip. I just want to say beforehand, I'm going, to, I'm going to be coming to you guys for questions. So if you have questions, doesn't have to be about God's pocket. Um, just have a think of what they might be. And so uh, when I come to you, you'll be ready. Thank you. And let's play the next clip. Thanks. Uh, Eddie, of the course. great is, Eddie Marzen. Is one of our own oh. uh, homegrown talents who we love and revere. Um, what made you think of Eddie for this Undertaker part? Um... I don't know. Was it Tyrannosaur? I don't know what I saw him in. I saw him right. in Mike Lee. I saw him in the, the little film 66. Oh, yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Great movie. Great performance. Yeah, Co it's to about totally different performance. It's set against the World Cup yeah, in, in 66. England. Yeah, 66. Yeah. yeah. A really great performance and completely different from what I'd seen him in before that. I can't remember what. Uh, kind of very I, genial, I guess. Yeah, in, in that. that. Yeah. Yeah. 
as opposed to the other. When as he was opposed just to ty- furious. Tyrannosaur, which oh. is, he couldn't be further apart. Um, I don't know. I just, I never got that image out of my head, and I almost lost him. Um, I definitely lost him once. And then I like, went back into the office. I went, wait a minute. No, no, no. We have to figure this out. I can't let this guy go because he lives here, I think, somewhere around here. And he has a family and he's busy working in L.A. So he, you know, I, to me, the hardest part of most of this was getting all those people in the same room. They all wanted to do it, but they're all very busy. And um, scheduling is not my strong suit. And, uh, and that's really what it comes down to. I mean, a movie of this size, you don't have the money to to throw at a problem you have to figure it out compromise ha- ask someone else for a favor you know to to change their schedule and you know hopefully they want to be in it enough to to um to accommodate that but uh he's he's fantastic in that in that scene phil that was the first day of shooting and phil um they didn't want, you know, we had this whole, we had a stunt man and we had, I mean, a stunt coordinator and they, you know, and, and they didn't want to fake it. Eddie didn't want to fake it and Phil didn't want to fake it, but Eddie kept getting clocked in the ear, right in the ear. And he and I started to, his ear was bleed. I mean, it was, he took a beating and there's a dead woman, not a live woman, but a fake dead woman in that, ca- in that casket. And I'm surprised they cut, co- did you cut before? Yeah, the, I'm not sure that was... Well, uh, it's... A, it's, um, a, it's I don't, I, but then I don't want to give it away. It's really... Well, the lid falls down. He falls against the casket, and the <laughs> lid falls down on the woman in the casket. It's... I mean, it doesn't, she doesn't get hurt. It's the funniest. It was an accident. Um, it was... He, they were rehearsing it, and he kept falling down, and the thing wobbled. So I'll tell you that... Hopefully, you'll go see it. But the, the, there was something. They, I had a guy, the prop guy, go behind the casket. And then when he falls into the coffin, we lowered the woman down. I learned more about dead bodies and caskets in this thing. I saw more dead bodies than I'd ever seen in my life. I would go into these funeral homes at, asking to take pictures. And they'd say, well, yeah, as long as you don't mind that guy. <laughs> and there'd be, you know, there'd be two dead guys on the, on a, on a, in a bag with like a toe sticking out. And, you know, we we got it. We we didn't pay any attention to it by the end. So, but anyway, they, they they lower the body down. They sort of raise the body up with these cranks for the funeral, and then when they go to close the coffin and bury it, they they crank put the cranks back on. They lower the body down, so the lid doesn't hit the body in the face. So we had to, we did that, and then I had someone push the lid closed when he fell. It was just anyway. It's the kind of it's emblematic of the f- humor in the movie. I, I think. I mean, it's very dark. I just, but that's the kind of thing that makes me laugh. Sorry. Right. right. We have microphones to left and right. Um, if you have a question, please put your hand in the air. Uh, you, sir. I'm going to go to you first. And can you wait for the microphone to arrive? Thank you. Okay, um, good evening, John. Um, good evening. It's nice to see you here in the UK. Thank you. Um, Basically, over your experience as a film as a director, um, which f- basically which films have you basically directed that actually really pushed you to be more of a successful director as you will be in future? So, which film basically basically influenced you? Said, I want to be a director. You mean watching what films? Wa- you know, watching films. That, no, no, that you directed. That well, this is the only film I've ever directed. Oh, great. So that's a that was a quick question now no the, i'll tell you though the films that i've watched i mean i grew up watching films in the 70s um i grew up watching coppola and scorsese and 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 john cassavetes and and there's a, a director peter yates who um made the dresser mm-hmm. as well as bullet as well as uh the friends of eddie Coyle, which to me is is the is the the film there's a with robert mitchum um called the friends of eddie Coyle shot in Boston in the 70s, uh, which I, I tried to get this film to look like. It was hard to do because they don't make film anymore, the actual film that we tried to get. They ran out of film. So we had to shoot digitally, but um, between Lance and myself, that was the film, the, the Peter Yates film that, that I, I most was inspired by when I did this. Hi, John. Hi. Um, I'm a big Mad, Mad, Mad Men fan. Um, Thank you. And I love the character Roger Sterling. Um, I wondered if you could tell me or us what your favorite Roger Sterling moment is. Um, I don't, I don't, I, that's, you know, there was a book a couple of years ago, there was a fake 
memoir written supposedly by the character and what it was just a collection of all the funny things that he said and I there were so it was like 200 pages of of quotes that I half of which I couldn't remember having said because there's so many um so it's hard to uh say I I I particularly always enjoyed the 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 scenes with Don Draper John Hamm and I hit it off immediately and um became uh, we're our, our very good friends and uh and we just have a great time working together. And those scenes I, I, I are I, probably my favorites. They're funny. They're they're usually well. They're always really well written. And um, and there's always something unsaid that the two characters know each other well enough not to have to say exactly what they want. I think that's what the show does well. Is it people don't necessarily have to come out and say exactly what they want. They can kind of skirt the uh, question or the issue well enough to uh, communicate what it is they want. Thank you. Um, oh, wow, we've got so many questions. So um, I think you're next, and then we'll come to you. Thank you. Good evening, John. Hi. Uh, pleasure to hear you talking about God's pocket. Uh, one comment and then a question. So as a thinking woman's kinky politician, I am really... It, those who have seen Sex in the City know what I'm talking about. Um, those who don't wonder Those who, who you don't are wonder and <laughs> whether they can get your phone number. Speak to me afterwards. Um, when you're producing, so when you're acting in something and also producing, how do you sort of make the switch? Or when you're acting, do you, well, one, how do you make the switch? And secondly, when you're acting, do you ever think, I would do this better, I would do this in a different way when I, if, I were, if I were the director? If, sorry, I, don't, yeah. I said producer, but I meant director. Yeah. And how, how do you work that in with your director if you do think that you could do it a different way? Well, I mean, that's why I started directing in the first place. I mean, I've stood around on film sets long enough to go, I wonder what I would do. You know, you ask questions, honest questions, not because you think you could do it better, but wh how, why do you start over there or what do you... And someone will say, well, you need to see him come in the room and then you, cut, you put the camera in the room and then you cut in between the two. It's funny. It's it seems confusing and overwhelming, and then you go, oh well, yeah. You need to see the guy from outside the building, and then you need to see him come inside the building. So, it's just a vi way of telling a story visually. And then you know, if you ask that question, what would I do? Enough, you start to think, well, maybe I. What 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 really would I do? What should I do? And so that's how I basically threw my hat in at Mad Men and asked if I could. It took. They, they, they said yes, but conditionally they said you have to follow a director around for, until, we tell you not, until we tell you to stop. And I did that for months. And you, and you just you know, ask all the questions you think you can think of and, and then you end up sort of a sounding board for you know, the more time you spend with somebody, this director I would follow, he'd say, well, what do you think of this? And you know, he'd kind of ask my opinion as an actor, being that I, it was a good situation because I was in the show, I knew the character, I knew the story, I knew the offices, the physical spaces. But the dip, but the question is so so as a director though it, what i learned i'll answer it this way what i learned as an actor from directing was that it is such a collaborative process that you know you think as an actor that you have this burden that you have to get the whole thing every time and you and 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 if i screw this up the whole thing will be ruined the movie the scene whatever the show it really isn't the case i mean you never use the same take. If we shot this conversation, you'd shoot one, maybe a wide shot of the two of us, and then over me onto Charles, and then you'd put the camera over there, and you'd shoot over Charles onto me, and then you'd intercut the three. So you're never going to use, you'd do, maybe do it four times, say. You would never use the same take of me twice. You know, I wouldn't have, you, all you have to get is a little piece here, and a little piece there, and a little piece there, and if you get the whole thing in pieces, that's the way it's going to be cut up anyway. I mean, and I watched actors, Al Pacino, I did a movie, and I realized he would never stop the camera. He would screw up a line, and he would just keep going, and he would get the next one right, and then he would screw up the next one, or get it wrong a little bit, and then he would keep going. And it's all in pieces. And I, you know, so it took the burden off of, the pressure off of a performance, which is no good for a performance. It has to be relaxed, you know? You have to be able to just be like, you know, it's an everyday scenario despite all the artificial elements, the cameras and the lights and the people and the, you know.
you know, the microphones and all that, the goal is to, for it to be, you know, like life. Great. You were next, I think. Hi, John. I'm really looking forward to seeing the film. Um, Thank you. It involves death, uh, drinking problems, gambling problems, but it's also all a my favourite things. So, so I'm wondering, as a director, how did you manage um, sort of getting those really difficult emotions and making them funny as well? Um, well, that's a good question. The book, that's what the book does. That's why I wanted to make the film in the first place, because it was a commingling of, of um, death and... Um, uh, but it's the death of someone no one likes. And then that, I always find that interesting that, you know, someone no one likes dies and then all of a sudden everyone loves them. Oh, he was a, what a great guy. He was a good, but if he was standing there, no one would talk to him. Um, so the, how that story changes after someone passes. And, um, and, and the fact that no one liked this guy made his death that much more commonplace. As I said, the violence is very commonplace. They're just people that are prepared to do what, what we're not necessarily prepared to do. If they need someone to move or if they need some information, they're prepared to go there and get it out of them. They'd rather not. They'd rather go have lunch. But if they have to, they will. Uh, that fascinates me. And, and, and if it's commonplace enough, if the violence is just something that happens enough, I found that could make it funny. Um, so it isn't, it isn't so jarring that, that the humor goes out of it. And the tone is, is in the book. The, 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 that's the tone that I tried to keep when, I, when I've made the film. Hello. Hello. Um, the film adaptation was mentioned earlier, which got me wondering how you found the process of adapting a novel into a film. Did you find it at all constricting? Uh, no, no, that's a good question. Um, I didn't, but I, uh, I adapted it by myself for a long time um, because I'm not a writer. I'd written, I had written one screenplay. I tried to get the rights, as I said. They said no. The company had it, so I forgot about it. And then I moved on to something else, and I, I, I bought the rights to a play. A friend of mine wrote a play, and I, and I adapted that. And then I, it, it didn't turn out so well because... It was a play that didn't really warrant... It wasn't visual enough. Um, so then when I found out later that the rights I thought were available, I didn't want to make that mistake again, so I just outlined it. I, I thought, all right, let me just go scene to scene, take what's in the book, interior bus, you know, Mickey comes home, exterior house, Mickey pulls in the driveway, you know, just an outline that I, had, that I got out of a book somewhere, that, you know, screenwriting book. And then when I got to the end of that, it was almost a draft. And then I started throwing in dialogue that I didn't want to forget. Just basically going through the book, taking out the pieces. And got to the end, said, okay, this works. Let's get the rights. And they said, oh, we made a mistake. The people still have it. You, you can't have it. I thought, well, you know, if, if, again, if they've had it this long, maybe they won't make it. So I'll just do it. And I don't have a deadline. I don't have a production hanging over my head or some actor's schedule. Like, so I just kept doing it, and then I'd put too much in, and then I'd take some out. So I didn't necessarily find it constricting, but when I finished, and I got to a point where I thought it was ready to show someone. I showed a friend of mine who's on the, who, who I wrote it with eventually, and he said, it's still too much the book. So I wasn't constricted by the book, but I was... It did take me a step to go, he said, you have to let go of the book now. You've used enough. You've used everything that's in that book. Now we have to invent this, or we have to just decide what this will be. We can do that. We have nine tenths of it written. So it wasn't constricting, but it did take me a minute to sort of let go of that idea. And the and the pro the process, though, I don't necessarily see. I have ideas of my own, but I I'm daunted by the blank page of you know. So I'd rather have source material. If I do this again, I'd rather I'd like to find another story, a play, a book, a. Uh, a something, a short story, whatever. Uh, hi, John. Uh, nice to have you here. Um, could you tell us what it's like working with Matthew Weiner, please? Um, it's uh, it's uh, many things. Um, he's brilliant. Um, he, uh, you know, as an actor, I mean, as an actor, it's probably the best material I've ever been given. Um, as a director, he's very specific about what he wants. He gives you the script. He sits you down in a meeting. It can take six hours. And um, 
He'll tell you, here's why I wrote this line, this line, that line, this line, that line, that direction. The whole thing. It's called a tone meeting. And you get the tone of it and why he wrote each scene in context of the script, why he wrote each script in context with the rest of the season. And then he said, I want, <clears throat> you know, I want you, when you get in the elevator, I want you to shoot over, you know, and then he goes, but do it your own way. <laughs> so you, 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 so it's, it's, it's not that easy because you are shooting what he needs because it is his show and it is his idea. This movie was my idea. Visually, I, I, I knew what, what I wanted. You're serving his vision. So he's extremely, I would say, extremely specific. Ex very funny, very smart, very specific. And you, once you're on board with that, there's a freedom in that, too. It's like you, you asked, it, 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 is it constricting? You would think maybe it was, but if the writing is good enough, which I think the writing is in this book, and I give all credit to the Pete Dexter because everything in the script was in the book. If the writing is good enough, there's, a, there's, there, there's room in there. It, it's open to interpretation. You could do the, the lines in Mad Men three different ways and they'd all work. You know, and every scene was like that. You could try it like this, you could try it like that, you could try it like that, and they all would work, and then it was just up to what, what would work best off of you know, each other. Hi, John. Hello. I come from France, and I am happy to see you <laughs> in real. Uh, for which reason you chose to be director? Maybe you don't, you was exhausted to be an actor, or it was maybe a dream when you were a kid? <laughs> I don't know. That's a good question. I, 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 I been making films and television and doing plays for a long time, and I, and I had my own ideas of how I would do it. You know, like we said, you know, like, like I've said, you know, you do someone else's idea for a long time, and then you think. What if I, if I was going to tell this story, I would do it differently. I would move the camera over here. I would have this person be louder. I would do that. I would, it, this would be sadder, funnier, what, whatever. You, and you, don't, you know, it's not my place to say that. So the only alternative is to do it myself. Um, and that's a scary thing to do because I've never done it. I'd never done it before. You have to sometimes, it's good to do what scares you, especially as old as I am. You know, it's, I mean, I'm not that old, but <laughs> no, but I mean, it's good. You know, what you, there aren't that many things when you get, I'm 51 years old. There aren't that many things when you get to be this age. If you, if, especially if you have any measure of success, you get to a certain point and people expect you to do more or less the same thing and you can succeed doing more or less the same thing. I could do television. I could do plays. I could do films and I could just, You know, take the script, take the money, do the thing. And they're challenging emotionally, but it's, you don't, I mean, it's, it's good. To be challenged and to be scared is, is makes you know you're alive. The guy in the white t-shirts had his hand up from the get-go, so I think we have to go to him. Um, last question from you, and I'm sorry to everybody else. Uh, hi, John. Um, hi. I'm an actor as well, uh, and I just wanted to know who your acting influences were, young, and kind of what your process is, maybe, in a nutshell, obviously. Um, and do, do you have any advice for young actors as well? Um, my, you know, I was, when I was a kid, I would, uh, I would come in the house. I would come in the house, I'd have my coat on, I'd grab the remote, and I would stand in front of the TV, intending to sit down and take my coat off. And then I would just stand there and click. And I wouldn't click like between channels. I would watch a scene and then they'd cut to a commercial and I'd turn on Derek Jacobi and like I, Claudius, or I'd turn on Mary Tyler Moore or The Odd Couple or, or My Man Godfrey or like any, I mean, any, I don't know. I, I was like, I was, I, I couldn't, and it was mostly the acting. It was just the moment between the, 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 the two actors. I mean, Robert De Niro, The Deer Hunter, Um, Robert Redford and Butch Cassidy. I mean, uh, Sean Penn, to me, is about as good as I've ever... You know, Daniel Day-Lewis, obviously. But there, I mean, I, but, but Derek Jacobi, when I was a kid, his Hamlet, I saw a BBC production of, of his Hamlet, and I, I didn't... I don't think I sat down for three hours. I don't know. I, I, I mean, so it was just the moment, you know, if you can... It can come from anywhere and anyone. 
Um, and, you know, you'd be conditioned to be, well, I have to look like Tom Hanks or somebody, you know, whoever's, you know, prevalent when you come up, you know, whoever it is whose style, I mean, Marlon Brando changed it for everyone. But beyond that, um, it can really come from anywhere. Um, and my, my, I don't know, my advice, work hard and don't quit because it isn't impossible. And people will tell you, oh, that's, it's impossible. But it's not. I mean, it's, it depends what you want out of it. And it isn't easy. I mean, it just takes commitment. It takes a lot of, a lot of hard work. Thank Good you. Good luck. Thank you. I'd like to thank everybody for coming and for your questions and your engagement. It's really appreciated. Thank you to, thank you. to the Apple. For having me. Thank you. Thank you to Apple Store, Reason Street, and to John.